Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark talks about a safe haven in today's troubled markets. Schachter Asset Management's Joseph Schachter tells us when he believes crude prices will turn around. And Bayhorse Silver President Graham O'Neill calls for a return to the uptick rule in Canada. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Well, it's been another very, very uh, volatile week, pretty much a one-way street. One analyst told me this is the weirdest, rockiest markets he's ever seen in the past few decades. It it brings back memories uh, for me of uh, the uh, the rollover in 2007, also back in 2000, um, early days back in the uh, in the 1970s. But uh, this one uh, to to start off as poorly as this in, in a year is uh, is unheard of. Um, you know, we're down what eight percent on the uh, the broad U.S. markets, the Dow and S and P. Toronto's down seven percent. You know the the we expected that classically in an election year you would see a minor sell off in the january february stretch get a little bit oversold and then you could rally back but in a non incumbent year such as we have now where the president's finishing off his his eighth year uh the brakes tend to be a little harder in the january february um, and uh the recovery into march april still would be the norm uh but uh, we're probably not going to make it back to the old highs. I think it, uh, uh, looking at history, we turn into more of a trading range for the uh, first calendar quarter. But we've got to, uh, we've got to get this selling out of the way right now. The uh, and the primary catalyst, I'd say, behind it has been uh, credit spreads from, for the second half of last year, then the, uh, the rollover of the Chinese market, and with the softness there, you've got uh, the break in the oil. So. Down uh, down 20% year to date in oil now clearly holding under $30, and uh, we're starting just starting to see some decent oversold conditions I would say in the in the oils, um, but uh, one needs to look for stability before you want to um, delve in too much in there. I've heard from some people they don't expect the price of oil to start going up until we start heading into driving season, which is late spring. Yeah, well, um, that it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, typically, you know, these markets, uh, the oil tends to spike down and go through a consolidation phase. So uh, we're we're still in that spikish category right now, and um, the uh, the seasonals um, would uh, normally suggest that you'd be bottoming out here, but this is this is uh, an unusual year by uh, by anybody's measurement. And low retail sales in December, Walmart is going to be closing over 450 stores worldwide. Well, you've got that type of action, you, and then you can see from the uh, the shippers, the UPSs, the FedExs, and that uh, uh, you know shipments are down across the board. Uh, even the ones who are getting the benefit uh, out of the internet sales through Amazon, etc. The um, the numbers are not good, and transports, as we talked about the early part of last year, were one of the um, real red flags out there. With the Dow uh, theory being uh, triggering a sell signal, and that's when transports and uh, industrials do not move up in unison, and you start to see the crack. So, um, it, I guess it's not surprising that uh, the transports were a leader in terms of an indication of what was going on as far as the economy was concerned. With such a large drop in the equity markets, I thought the price of gold and silver would start to show some real advances, but so far, very modest. Yeah, we're we're into that seasonal period that I was looking for some strength here um, and uh, thinking that it would last into the second half of January, maybe take us into February. But uh, the it really hasn't gained much in the way of uh, momentum behind it. We had, I think, uh, this week the uh, the pullback that we had had from well uh, roughly $1,110 down to uh, 1080. 
that is is allowable as far as the technicals are concerned right now, but we want to see some strength start to kick in here in a better way. As, and I think that uh, the 1080 level is really the um, spot that you've got to keep in mind that must hold at this point because we do have some cyclic work that shows the next period of pressure probably comes to a head at the end of March, early April. And uh, for us uh, to have just basically held in U.S. dollars this gold price with without a breakout, um, it's it doesn't have the leadership that you'd be looking for. Now, if you holding gold in Canadian dollars, it's been doing exactly what you want. It's been offsetting the currency decline. Uh, so with silver and gold really not doing well, the only safe haven that you can look out there and see that's been working has been over in the government bond sector. Um, the uh, uh, the Anything that I would say was rated with an A-plus um, on either the corporate side or the government side has uh, seen some price action uh, work for it since the beginning of the year. And for now, I think that's uh, that's the best place to be for anything in the way of new positions. But I've uh, been watching the uh, the VIX this week, and that's the measurement of option premiums on the CBOE. We got up to 30 on the VIX uh, on Friday, and that's starting to get to, into high territory. And I can see that the we've had nine weeks here that we've been basically working up on VIX. We've got the RSI on it uh, trading uh, just around 60. And if there's much follow-through next week on VIX, um, showing that there's fear in the market and that people are buying, uh, paying excessive premiums for put protection in the options, that would be the type of thing we would look for at uh, at a bit of an interim low here. And from a seasonal perspective, as I say, in post in election years with non-incumbents, you'd be looking for a low somewhere between the 22nd of January and the 8th of uh, February. So look look maybe for some type of a turnaround the latter part of next week or the following week. Ross, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Well, it's a pleasure, and let's uh, hope that next week's better for the investors. My guest has been Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. His email, ross.clark at cibc.ca. Coming up next, Joseph Schachter on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Joseph Schachter from Schachter Asset Management in Calgary. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Joseph. My pleasure, Jim. Well, back in December, you really called it. You said the price of oil was going to plunge. It's trading just below $30 a barrel for the best quality oil. What do you think we're going to see first, $20 oil or $40 oil, and why? Well, right now, the... Um you know, the pressure is coming, um, not as much by the fundamentals, but by the risk off trade where, uh, the stock markets are getting beat up around the world. Um, you're having massive, you know, significant currency moves. There's concern about, uh, Hong Kong or Saudi Arabia breaking their peg to the U.S. dollar. Uh, so you've got U.S. yields going down, but the U.S. dollar is also weakening. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the fix, which is, uh, the, the sign of fear, it's only at 28, and normally when you get a market bottom, you're at 50, or you know, in in, uh, in 2008, 2009, you were up at 80. So until the VIX gets into the 40s and 50s, I wouldn't be looking for a bottom, and I'd be looking for a risk-off trade, where you know people who have uh, you know metals and oil and stocks and bonds, if they have any leverage, they're getting margin calls, and of course, you know, you may want to sell your dogs. But the reality is you've got to sell what you have to sell or what can be sold um, to provide the liquidity to meet the margin call. And so everything is in that implosion, uh, panic, uh, you know, kind of uh, situation. My guess is we may see oil now that it's 29 and a half um, and uh, potentially, um, you know, there's some rumors that the, the Saudis are, are thinking about removing their U.S. dollar peg. If that happens over the next week or two, we could, and also I think the market heading into the end of this month potentially could take another thousand or two thousand points off the Dow, maybe a thousand points off the Canadian market. 
We're down 408 today to 15970 on the Dow. So, you know, taking off another thousand points is not calling for a big, big move. Uh, but 2000, you know, is, is a bit bigger. Um, and uh, the reality is if that happens and you have more margin calls and liquidation, uh, we could go down to the mid 20s. I do not see $20 oil. Uh, so my guess, uh, in my in my view, is um, we plunge down here with a, 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 ma- um, a market meltdown uh, that gets climactic in the next week or two. So seven to ten days from now, potentially you have your low, um, and that would give us a low in copper, a low in, in oil, a, a low in uh, the stock market, and then from there we would see recovery. My view is from the fundamental side, oil should be trading north of 40 sometime in March, April, um, and that uh, the Iran fears that we have now and, um, you know, the, the issues of a glut and, uh, you know, and the rest of it, by March, April, things should resolve to the extent that we'll see a lot more shut-ins of production. U.S. production from the shales are coming down. We got that data from the EIA this week. Um, so once we start seeing U.S. weekly production data start to roll down um, and Iran is integrated and, and you can see what that does, uh, I think that the worst case of people throwing ten dollars out and you know crazy numbers like that will be wrong. You know, when I was at a hundred dollars in the second quarter of 2014, when I was talking uh, that the data was starting to be bearish, uh, everybody was throwing for 120, 150. You know, the tr- you know, so everybody was just trendlining the direction. Now you've got everybody trendlining the direction on the south side and calling for these you know absurd lows. And, you know, the, the market's going to come down and the price of oil is going to come down because of liquidation, because of the margin call issue. Um, and uh, to me, um, you know, mid-20s make sense. Um, anything below that uh, does not. And we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies in the states. Uh, a lot of the junk bonds that are related to the energy sector are going to get beat up bad. Um, in Canada, we'll probably see a number of companies, um, you know, shrink or or go 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 down. Um, you know, file for for bankruptcy uh, at at these kinds of prices at 25 U.S. Um, even though the Canadian dollar is at 68 cents, um, most companies cannot survive. Uh, and the hedge books that they had in 2015 are are mostly. Uh, not uh, as favorable for 2016. So even if you do have the cheaper Canadian dollar and some hedges, um, most companies will not be uh, making much net back, which means survival is is, uh, is an issue. And as we see more and more companies announce goodbye, um, I think that would you know sets up the sec the sector for another uh, cycle. Um, and of course, we've seen that in the 1980s. Dome Petroleum disappeared. Uh, we saw a number of other companies disappear in, can- in the states right now. Uh, you know, people are talking about a number of companies that have already gone under, um, and they've talked about some Canadian companies with b- bad balance sheets that are being pointed at and saying these companies probably will fail. When oil does bottom, does the price usually remain low for an extended period of time, or does a new bull market emerge fairly quickly? No, oil is a very spiky commodity. Um, it goes down and uh, it goes down, you know, much below replacement cost, and then it recovers. So, for example, in 2009, it went down to 33.55 from 147, you know, you know, six months earlier in the or nine months earlier in the second quarter of 20, 2008, it was 147, went down to 33, and then within six months, it was trading over 70 again. Um, you go down to 2001, it went, was then went down to $17, and within six months it was 29. So my view is we get down to whatever this spiky shakeout is, you know, 24, 25, whatever. Um, my thinking is more of a time, the next week or two. Um, and then once we get into February, the data will be clearly showing U.S. production coming down. Uh, Iran will have already happened, and, and it will be discounted. Um, and my guess is we'll be $40 oil by the March-April period, and then potentially, um, you know, by the winter 2016, 2017, we'll be looking at uh, north of $50 again. Can you maybe explain the different types of oil and their current prices? Yeah, I was, uh, Jim, I don't spend enough time on it, so I don't have the data in front of me, but heavy oil, of course, always trades less, and bitumen, which is not upgraded, always trades at less of a price. Um, and you're seeing numbers like uh, mid-teens and uh, for heavy oil um, and also for the bitumen. Um, and, of course, then if you try to put it on a rail car and move it to the States to sell it, 
you're really not making any money. So my view is that regular conventional heavy oil will probably get shut in. Um, just like we saw with Conacher, there's going to be longer maintenance periods, so we may see some of that from the oil sands guys. But if you're doing sand D, the problem is that if you if you stop steaming, you can you can impact the reservoir negatively, and you're really not sure if it's going to come back. So anything that's thermal, to me, probably doesn't get touched. Conventional crude, conventional heavy um, is probably going to get shut in. And in the United States, one of the biggest areas to probably see shut-ins is stripper wells, including if we have you know strippers in Canada, which you know, which are not what you think it is. It's stripper wells are uh, wells that produce under 15 barrels a day. So wells that produce five or ten barrels a day at a hundred dollars, you can make good, some good money. Um, at uh, you know twenty twenty five dollars, um, don't make you any money. And so those are the wells. Uh, you know, because they have op costs probably equal to 20 bucks or more, and then you have to pay some royalties, and you have G&A, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are the kinds of wells that will probably see a shutdown, and that's about a million barrels in the United States of production, the stripper production. My guess is a third or a half of that could get shut in in the next six months. What was the high for the oil sands oil, and what is the current price, and what price will be needed to get the oil sands back to work? Well, oil sands did trade at a premium to WTI. So uh, when we had the the W, you know, trading at 105, 106 in 2014, you know, some of the guys were getting premiums. Uh, right now, um, you know, the the price of of you know is it, the real thing is, you know, it's backstopped into Alberta because the issue is transportation. Uh, Cushing is pushing the limit at you know 63 million barrels. Um, there's not a lot of capacity there for storage. As I mentioned to you earlier, taking oil down by rail, um, which costs ten to twelve dollars a barrel, plus you have your regular op costs, you know, for for uh, you know for producing it, uh, the numbers just don't start working. And the question is, does it get backstop and guys start slowing down their production? And I think that's what this capitulation and climactic action um, that I'm looking for over the next week or two probably does for oil, where well, companies just say we can't make money cash on cash. Uh, and we're not getting a contribution to G&A. We're not getting a contribution to, uh, you know, to, to, to service debt. Uh, and if you have a cash burn, uh, you know, in other words, to produce a barrel of oil, it's costing you cash, and you're already in the doghouse, uh, you know, on your balance sheet. You know, then at that point, the gun comes to your head, and you say, we can't, we can't do this. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for joining us here on This Week in Money. My guest is Joseph Schachter from Schachter Asset Management in Calgary. We've talked about all the storage facilities around the world being full with this excess crude oil, how can anybody turn up production when all these things still need to be sold off or produced or, or sent to a refinery? Well, the, the, the excess production, um, you know, is probably about, you know, if, if Iran comes on, uh, there'll be a half a million to 700,000 barrels a day of excess capacity right now because winter is normally when you have higher demand, supply and demand are in balance. So the wild card is the next incremental production, which would be from Iran, uh, which could come on. But the question is, how quickly does it can they ramp up? The the issue though is demand's growing by about a million barrels a year, uh, you know, all around the world. And you know, demand in the states is up, demand in Canada is up, demand in China, even though growth is slowing, is still up. There's you know they have record car sales, um, second largest car market in the world. Uh, so if you have a million barrels a day, remember, we're talking about a 93, 94 base. So if it goes from 94 to 95 in 2016, um, you know, so at the same time, if you have a million barrels of demand growth and you have a million barrels of supply non-OPEC that disappears um, between stripper and other production that falls off from the shales, then you have a two million barrel swing. By the time you get into Q3 of 2016, you're going to start seeing the storage uh, that's uh, that's uh, that that right now is glutted will start coming down, and to me that is what sets up the stage for 50 and 60 dollar oil when you start seeing repetitive weeks of declines in uh, in the storage numbers. And so the 40 to 50 dollar oil will happen this summer. Uh, it'll st- the data will start showing up this summer. It may take into the fall. Um, you know, the 40s should happen this summer. The 50s probably will not happen. Um, you know, with any you know being a repetitive number with a five handle, probably until the fourth quarter of 2016. And of course, as you said, record vehicle sales. The vehicles in the U.S. that are being sold are the uh, gas-guzzling SUVs. Is that going to suck up a lot of this excess oil? 
Well, it, it'll you know it'll stimulate demand because you do pay you know two dollar gas um, in the states and in Canada, of course, uh, in Alberta we're low eighties right now, um, eighty one to eighty three in Calgary right now per liter. Um, I don't doesn't it hasn't changed my driving habit, but for people who have young families who may want to do driving holidays, uh, it, you know, versus flying holidays. I think, you know, with the economy being as it is and, you know, job problems that, that are occurring in, in the oil patch that Alberta is being um, impacted on to a greater degree than other parts of this country um, by the uh, commodity um, devastation going on, uh, my guess is, you know, driving demand for energy will go up. Uh, cars are more efficient because the truck you may have, you know, you may buy yourself another, you know, F-150 or, you know, or, or a GMC or whatever, uh, these trucks that you're buying now, which are, you know, are, are bigger gas guzzlers than a car, but the, the efficiency of where the truck you're, that you're removing from the, you know, from the equation. So if, you know, if you're doing a seven year upgrade, you know, you bought your vehicle, you know, 2007, 2008, now you're buying a 2016. The vehicle in 2016 is much more fuel efficient. If the U.S. is self-sufficient in oil, will this change oil markets around the world? Well, it means that the, uh, you know, that's why Brent and WTI have narrowed. If you remember, uh, Brent was trading at a significant premium. Uh, now that you've got the ability from the U.S. to, to export oil and, and export product, uh, the arbitrage is gone, and now the two are trading in tandem. Um, and in some days you see Brent trade below WTI, other, other days the other way, but they do now move in tandem. Uh, the United States really, you know, uh, of the imports that they have of just under 5 million barrels, half of that comes from Canada, uh, a chunk comes from Mexico, a chunk comes from uh, Venezuela, and uh, the only real OPEC country that sends much to the United States is Saudi Arabia, and they see, you know, that market diminishing even for them. So that's why they're, um, the battle is on between, you know, Russia and, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and, and potentially now Iran for the growth in the Asian markets. You know, Russia, of course, from Siberia can easily move oil by pipe or by, by ship from the, you know, the, you know, east coast of, of Russia, you know, Vladivostok down or by pipe. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the OPEC countries are all fighting for it. And Iran has already pre-positioned ships in Singapore uh, so that when they get the sanctions removed, potentially um, in the next few days, uh, that they have immediate product to sell and they can get the money from that um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, move forward, you know, because they're going to need to spend over a hundred billion dollars to revitalize their industry because they haven't had access to western technology um, for so long so to you know to get their fields to produce at, the, at higher rates uh, you know we also you know the the number one the fields need maintenance and you know the equipment that's not that they have that they couldn't get access to they're now going to get access to if sanctions are removed but the second thing is we don't know how good their pipeline systems are you know they really haven't been a big uh, player you know for the last 10 20 years and a lot of pipelines of course have been run at low pressure all of a sudden you try to ramp up production and if the pressure doesn't work and the pipe has got eroded um, you know we've seen a lot of pipeline problems in north america and i think we do we probably take good care of ours relatively so i think iran's potential uh, ramp up is less likely than uh, is being feared because uh, a lot of stuff has to be done for them to uh, have their production and their equipment run run to the ability that they want it to raise production i've heard some analysts say that canada is a wash in natural gas that we should give up on exporting a lot of oil and instead really get into the LNG game because Asia needs it to replace coal. Well, uh, you know, there's so many people trying to get into that LNG game. Australia's ramped up their production. Uh, Middle East has done that. The southern part of the United States already has the infrastructure and they're already going to be exporting in the next couple of months. Um, and we don't have an approval system yet. We don't have the environmental issues resolved. We don't have the native land claims, the First Nations issues resolved. Um, to me, we missed the boat. We will not see LNG in this decade. Uh, I know people are talking about a couple approvals that might happen by the end of the year. I'm not in that same camp. I think that we missed it. Our, uh, uh, the lack of getting everybody to the table and the greed of the players uh, just shafted Canada from that scene. Joseph, is there any way people can find out more about Schachter Asset Management? 
Well, I provide E&P um, research uh, for a boutique in Toronto called Maison Plus Mont, M-A-I-S-O-N-P-L-A-C-E-M-E-N-T-S. Uh, if they want to subscribe to our monthly newsletter uh, that I put out, uh, they can just go to the www.maisonplusmont.com. Thanks a lot for chatting with us. My pleasure. My guest has been Joseph Schachter from Schachter Asset Management in Calgary. Coming up next, Graham O'Neill here on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. My guest is Graham O'Neill. He's the president and CEO of Bay Horse Silver. It's listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol BHS, and online at bayhorsesilver.com. Graham, welcome to This Week in Money. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. The Venture Exchange has put out a white paper looking for input to improve the junior capital markets in Canada. You responded with a public letter to the president of the exchange that's gone viral, and you just did an interview about that with business in Vancouver. First off, why are the entrepreneurs the most important people in the junior markets? Well, it's not just the junior markets. The entrepreneurs are the most important people in the markets, period. They're the ones that got the drive and the energy to take the risks and to put their own money into uh, creating ventures and, um, and employing people. The junior market specifically, we employ a lot of people. Well, at least we did uh, up until the last few years. And uh, so it's very important that you know the entrepreneurs are supported because uh, they provide the backbone to the economy. Contrary to um, uh, majority opinion, where uh, it's the uh, the little guys, entrepreneurs create businesses that create jobs. Can you tell us about the uptick rule? Who can bring it back, and how it can help? Well, that's an interesting issue. Um, the uptick rule was in place, and it caused a, a, a sort of a circuit breaker to um, hold back uh, mass shorting. And um, what happened when the um, regulators and the uh, politicians got involved and said we want more competition in exchanges in the Canadian marketplace. They found one of the um, unfortunate problems with it was that there was no longer efficient price discovery. So um, the uptick rule was essentially if a uh, share was trading at a specific price, um, you couldn't sell it unless it traded up. So because you can't get efficient price discovery, it was causing all kinds of problems. When can you uptick and when can you short? So uh, they just said, oh, we're just going to move it and um, get rid of it. So now what can happen if someone wants to short, they can just short a stock down to zero. And um, it's, a, uh, it, it's not a good situation, frankly. In other words, trade a company right out of existence. Uh, they can do that. Now, the regulators are the ones that uh, cause the problem, regulators and the politicians. And with computer trading, I don't see any reason why it, it, it can't stay. I, I mean, if, if we can get a, uh, a spaceship to uh, outer space, out to Pluto, and we can guide it around Pluto and uh, take great photos, all with the help of computers, why can't we do a simple thing like the, on Earth to um, put a small uptick rule back in place? We've heard the argument the uptick rule can't be brought back due to the existence of multiple trading platforms. Do you really buy that argument? No, I don't. As I said, you know, they, you can do anything with computers these days. You know, there should be no reason why it can't be done. And um, they cause the problem, the regulators and the um, and the politicians. Let them fix it. It's their problem. But they've made it our problem. Germany banned shorting. Was that a good move? I believe it was. Is shorting good or bad for the junior markets? Well, you know, the exchange uh, uh, has put out this white paper, and, and they've um, made a big thing about all the participants, entrepreneurs and everyone else. So when you form a public company, there's an enormous amount of uh, people they support. We support lawyers. We support uh, accountants. We support regulators. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we want to support regulators, but they're, they're in a position where they benefit from what we do. So um, if you put a loaded gun in someone's hand and says don't fire it, and they do, you can kill a company. And um, we just see that uh, with shorting, there's, uh, there's too much um, room for abuse. I mean, 
bay horses had some shorting in the past. I don't believe we've got any shorts at the moment, but we we don't really know because it's very difficult to find out. So I, I think it's bad for the junior markets. You know, the whole reason for the junior markets is to build and grow companies. So if you're already going to uh, put them out on the gangplank and uh, give them a quick prod to put them in the water, you know, why... Uh, why bring them to the uh, to the markets in the first place? Well, it appears there's no longer a level playing field. What happened? Well, um, now that's a regulatory issue. IROC is um, the major regulator in the markets these days, um, especially for the um, for the brokerage houses and the um, the banks, et cetera, and so forth that are playing around in the markets. And um, they're the ones that are actually uh, causing a lot of problems with their regulations. For example. I've had numerous brokers call me and say, well, Graham, we can't uh, uh, go and buy Bay Horse Silver because we get too much hassle from the back office because you're a, a small junior company with, you know, not too much liquidity. And they say the IROC actually comes in and says, well, this, this is not an appropriate investment for these people. Well, you know, it seems to me that um, under the... Uh, Canada Rights and Freedoms, uh, there'd be an argument to say that IROC has got no place in telling a person what he can or cannot invest in. In fact, I, I heard at one stage, and this is this is solely hearsay, that um, an IROC regulator said to a broker that, um, well, that's not an appropriate investment for this gentleman who just happened to be a billionaire, and um, uh, he was brought to worth in a uh, uh, you know very short order for uh, saying that a billionaire doesn't know anything about, um, uh, you know, investing and shouldn't invest in a, in a junior company. So um, the regulators, I think, are uh, got a lot of issues that they've put in place that has uh, taken the uh, playing field for investors away from being level. There's some other issues there as well, and this goes back to uh, price transparencies. Because you've got so many now platforms trading in the Canadian market, the same shares, and I, I think there's 10 or 11, it's mind-boggling, you can't find out what pricing is. And I've had numerous brokers say to me, Graham, I can't find your price because it's trading on so many different platforms or priced on so many different platforms. So um, I, I, I think um, market transparency is, is really important. And again, with computers, you should be able to make that right front and center, here's all the trades, this is where it is, this is what the various platforms are quoting it at, and, and it should be readily available. Well, if the government is so concerned about people losing money in a junior market investment, how come they don't have people guarding the doors of casinos asking, can you afford to lose that money? <laughs> you know, you, you got you to gotta have me laughing there, but it's not only that. You know, they talk about the junior markets and uh, the risks there. I would argue that um, probably the New York Stock Exchange is the biggest gamble in the world and, and the biggest scam in the world, literally because of the billions of dollars that are uh, that have been lost there over the years. Um, and these are the big market players. So, you know, you can't compare the uh, the losses that have been made on on the junior exchanges uh, to the massive massive losses that are that are hit on the on the on the larger exchanges and but the the problem that exists again is over regulation if there's no risk there will be no reward the greater the risk the greater reward if uh, if investors um, don't want to take risks the banks are quite willing to put their money in to deposits, uh, give them a minor little bit of interest, and um, watch it fade away as, as inflation goes. But um, that's a, um, a discussion for another time, frankly. It's just that the more risk, the more reward. And, um, and people have to know you cannot regulate risk, no matter what you do. What are predatory and manipulative trading practices in the junior markets? Well, that, that's kind of an interesting one. Um, the regulators put out an explanation of what predatory and manipulative trading practice are, and I've read them through. And um, uh, frankly, they're allowing things to go on that are legal and I consider manipulative, um, such as uh, there's one, um, one company out there or one group of people that constantly trade 
uh, shares in the uh, junior markets, and it probably goes on in the senior markets as well, but the, the minimum board lot is 1,000 shares. So they sell 1,000 shares in a very, very, very slim market, very a liquid market, and it may cause a stock to go down two cents, and, and that may be 20%. So, you know, I've often wondered uh, how they're able to do that. Well, they do such an enormous volume of shares that it appears they get a break. So a thousand shares at uh, three cents is uh, thirty dollars, but it only costs them a dollar to do the trade. And it seems to me that um, the venture exchange um, has point oh oh three cents, so it should theoretically cost three dollars. So someone's getting a break somewhere, and um, if they're not shorting it, if they're buying small lots at very, very minor prices and then um, selling it at a profit, I mean, it's totally legal. But a thousand share trade, um, when there's nothing else happening, that's manipulative, in my point of view. Where are the regulators on that? Well, you know, we've complained to the regulators many, many times, and uh, they essentially have said there's nothing they can do about it. Um, if it's not, um, if it's legal, there's nothing they can do. So it, it comes down to what is um, a manipulative trade. They've got their uh, definition, and um, and that's really where it sits. So is this a case of the regulators have, have bitten off more than they can chew, or have they just unintendedly made things more complicated than they need to be? Well, I, I, I certainly think that it's the law of unintended consequences. I don't think it was properly thought through when they um, decided they want um, more competition they didn't clearly understand at the time that, uh, you know, this issue would come up um, because you've got the um, a, a different number of, uh, of of exchanges that are trading the shares. I'm quite sure that uh, they never thought about the uptick rule, and then they figured that, uh, uh-oh, we've got a problem here. So rather than fix it, which would probably cost money and, and computer time, uh, they just chose to ignore it and we'll get rid of it. So, you know... It's their problem, but they've placed it on us, so it's become our problem, and uh, it's affecting us. Well, we keep hearing that they're over-regulate, deliberately over-regulating the junior market to kill it so that people are forced to go to the big banks and their trading companies. Well, I, I, I think people like IROC and that, they're, um, you know, they answer to the, um, to the market participants, and... Um, uh, they've extended a lot of their regulatory reach to the junior markets, to the companies themselves. As an example, um, uh, you know, they require us to submit every news release for uh, um, regulatory purposes before we can put it out into the market. So uh, uh, they're interfering with the boardroom. But as far as a conspiracy theory goes... Um, I've heard it. I don't necessarily believe in conspiracy theories, but I think there's economic warfare going out there between the um, the banks and as the major participants in um, wanting to get rid of the uh, the smaller in, um, independent investment uh, dealers. And um, you know, I, that's a predatory practice in my view, but it's not necessarily a conspiracy. It's it's something that you know everyone wants to get bigger. Everyone wants to corner the resource, which in this case is money. And I think the, um, in their opinion, the, the general good is, you know, whatever's best for the large guy, because uh, they're always trying to squeeze the little guy out. But it's not good for the capital markets, especially the junior markets, because the banks do not support small business, even though they say they do. You go to the bank and you try to get a loan, uh, they'll look at you and say, unless we get your house, your car, and your wife, and, uh, you know, we're not going to give you any money, but here's the umbrella if you give us those things. And the moment they um, see a little bit of rain on the horizon, they want the umbrella back. I mean, that's just how the banks are. Now, there's some other issues there that no one ever, ever gets to. And um, that's we've now got bail-ins as practice in Canada. So even if you put your money in the bank, there's no guarantee you're going to get it back because it's a loan to the bank. Everyone thinks it is theirs. No, it's not. And then you have things like um, hypothecation and rehypothecation. Uh, in fact, it, just even in opening up a um, uh, a brokerage account, you read the fine print. You go to hypothecation and you go, oh, what's that? 
Um, well, that's a subject on in itself, but essentially it says if the guy you're dealing with and you've written the agreement with um, owes money to someone else, your account, if you owe money to the broker, is then hypothecated through to the the next guy up the line. So uh, it, uh, it, it gets to be a pretty nefarious sort of state of affairs that uh, not a lot of people know about. Vancouver is, or was, the junior mining capital of the world. Is it time for a new exchange to be located in Vancouver that understands the junior mining industry? Well, you know, I said to uh, a couple of other company presidents the other day that um, the Venture Exchange and the TSX Exchange um, is majority owned by banks. So, uh, yeah, it's got a lot of other shareholders, smaller shareholders. But So it, it seems to me you've got a conflict of interest. You've got... Um, uh, the big financial institutions owning a, an exchange, which is a pro, for profit organization, and we're the clients. Um, so um, the thing I, uh, I, I, I said to a couple of other um, CEOs was maybe all the public companies should trade on their own exchange. They should own the shares in it. And um, so <laughs> the, uh, there was a few raised eyebrows, I must admit, but... Um, it's certainly a thing to think about. Um, if we're held to um, high standards by the regulators and uh, we're drained of money by the um, uh, not just the regulators but by the um, the exchange, maybe that uh, is not a good place to be. Changing board lots. What are board lots and how can they help? Well, the reason I mentioned changing board lots is because of this thousand share downtick, which is very, very common with majority of the junior companies are trading on the venture exchange and they also it also probably happens on the uh, on the TSX as well essentially it just says that um, if you uh, if you go under a dollar a board lot it's a thousand shares and it's a uh, and it trades um, that way so it's the minimum trade you can make a thousand shares but when you're down at one or two cents thousand shares is nothing ten dollars you know ten cents it's uh you know hundred dollars so there was a time when a hundred dollars was a lot of money and uh most people can remember that you know you uh go and get a starbucks and uh cost you um you know a buck and a half two bucks uh now it's what is it three bucks four bucks so a hundred dollars doesn't go as far anymore and it's the same with the um when you're purchasing shares, buying or selling, maybe they, maybe it should be a thousand dollars, no matter what. So, um, if you're, uh, or five hundred dollars, minimum trade, you know, and, and I, and, and you adjust the board lot to reflect that minimum trade. So rather than having a, um, a board lot as a, uh, as a number of shares, you have it as the dollar figure. So every, every share that trades under ten cents, for example, you have to do a minimum $500 trade, which is, uh, you know, 4,000 shares or whatever the amount is on that amount um, under under 10 cents. We used to have dozens and dozens of independent investment houses. Most of them have now disappeared. We're down to a handful. Could they return if the regulatory environment improves? Well, that's part of the economic warfare going on out there between the uh, large financial institutions and the uh, small ones. There's so much regulatory stuff going on out there right now that um, the cost of the back end of the brokerage houses is enormous. Um, the larger organizations, such as the banks, um, they can afford it. It's pennies um, on their on their income. But uh, if you've got a whole bunch of regulations that have to happen and you need oversight on them, then there's more risk to the brokerage house. So... Uh, uh, and they can't keep these costs in line. So the regulators, the regulatory people are imposing these costs which are disproportionate to the incomes of the smaller houses. So they've been merging not only to fight the economic battle with the large, larger companies, uh, the banks, but also to uh, reduce the regulatory burden. I don't know personally whether they would be able to grow up again in a, in a different environment. But uh, I, I, I'm certainly sure in my mind that the, uh, the regulators are a big part of causing this problem. Is it true when the junior markets are running right in Canada, we get to see a lot more investment and jobs in the country? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, for example, Bay Horse Silver. You know, we have uh, a number of consultants, four of them um, are PhDs, so we can't employ them on a permanent basis because we're not big enough yet. So they uh, are also employed by other other companies. We have accountant. You know, we have one accountant uh, pretty much full time, uh, does all our accounting and all our financials. But we also engage our auditor. That's a significant uh, charge every year. We have lawyers. We have people that are. Um, on the phones, talking all the time. Uh, you know, you can only stretch yourself so thin. Secretaries, there's an enormous, enormous number of jobs that we provide. I look at Vancouver right now and um, the city, and I, and I look at the number of um, office spaces that are going empty. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was running as probably $100,000 a year of shareholders' money to have an office downtown. And, and it, it, it's actually fairly critical to have a, an office where you're also mixed in with a lot of other people so you can get, you know, feedback from them, you see them, you talk to them. But I, I looked down at the coffee shop underneath where my office used to be and um, it's nowhere near it it was. I, I mean, the, the people going through it are, are much, much less. So we've hollowed out, you know, a lot of us are cut down on costs, but a lot of us have moved out of Van, uh, Vancouver Center City um, proper into uh, less expensive accommodations, and that means that money is not going into the uh, the economy in Vancouver. It's just being pulled out of it. Everyone's hurting. Does the TXX Venture have the power to make the changes you've suggested, or is it up to IROC to make those changes? No, the um, the exchange is actually the facilitator of making um, trades happen and uh, ensuring that, uh, of course, they make a profit. The regulatory environment, it's up to IROC. Um, IROC is uh, responsible for whether a company shorts or an exchange shorts or doesn't short. Um, uh, and, in fact, uh, I think, it, you know, shorting is actually out of control of the exchange. That happens at the brokerage. It happens in the banks. So, uh, but yes, I believe the venture exchange should be a vocal proponent of uh, of making these things happen, making these changes. You know, we do need a level playing field, and unfortunately, um, everyone thinks that uh, us entrepreneurs are, um, as uh, a lot of people think, are, shall I say, uh, less than honest with the markets. But uh, that's not the case at all. Majority of people, in fact, I don't know of anyone who's uh, out to fleece investors. You know, we're all trying to create wealth for our shareholders and look after our shareholders. And if we create wealth for ourselves at the same time, it's because we've done a good job for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in my mind that um, um, the regulators are, are um, have gone overboard um, trying to uh, regulate risk away from the markets, and you can't regulate risk. If you got to be in charge of the junior markets for a day, would you bring back the uptick rule or ban shorting? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> without a doubt. It comes down to psychology. You know, there's a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, think that uh, they're getting robbed, stolen from in the junior junior markets. They're actually getting robbed, stolen from in the senior markets too. But it's not the entrepreneurs, and it's not it's not the uh, uh, the shareholders themselves. There is a um, what I call a parasitical element, and uh, they believe it's their right to take money on both sides, and they provide nothing, in my opinion, to the benefit of the market. They may provide liquidity, but liquidity at that price, no, I don't want it. I'd rather see uh, shorting banned completely. Can you tell us more about Bay Horse Silver? Well, uh, Bay Horse Silver is um, on the Venture Exchange. Obviously, the symbol is BHS. We have a website, which is um, bayhorsesilver.com. And um, our main projects are a small silver mine down in Oregon. It used to be a past producer. It was producing at uh, 17 to 20 ounces a ton. And that's significant when you think that... Um, just recently, reports coming out that the primary silver producers are now producing around seven and a half ounces a ton. So we're looking at two and a half times the um, the average grade from primary silver producers. 
and um, we're allowed to take up to 15,000 tons off the property every year without any further permitting. So uh, with the advent of ore sorting and uh, dense media and the advances made in it, we believe we can take the grades up substantially higher than what we um, currently have, which is a historical estimate. But uh, those numbers were good enough to mine in 84 when the price of silver was up uh, much higher than it is today. And um, without the ore sorting, they were marginal. But with ore sorting, you can take up to um, five, six, seven times the grade without having to put it through a... Um, significant um, uh, milling process, crushing process, and you eliminate a lot of the, um, the waste material uh, before you truck it. So you're trucking higher grades. And we've just taken on a, um, a major project, again, silver lead zinc up in the Silver Valley. Now there's well over a billion, billion four ounces of silver being produced in the Silver Valley. Uh, it's the second... Um, most significant producer of silver in the world. Heckler's Lucky Friday has been mining there for years. Wouldn't even like to think how long. And the second um, property is uh, Graham? The second property is the, we call it Bridging the Gap. It's actually the old Government Gulch property on the Silver Valley, and um, it sits between the Bunker Hill and the Page Mines, um, just outside of Kellogg, Idaho, in Smelterville, in fact. There's an airport right across the freeway from it. Um, golf course is an actual fact, only about half a mile away. Right off I-90 in the Silver Valley, it belonged to uh, Asako, and uh, they stopped mining it during the, um, the EPA Superfund cleanup of the Silver Valley, and it's just recently come available. So... Uh, because we're focusing on silver, and because, again, it's patented ground, it had five silver mines on it, we thought it was just an absolute fit, along with our Bay Horse silver mine. And, um, again, both properties on patented ground, we can go mining straight away, or we can go exploring straight away, and we don't have to go through the immense expense and time-consuming process of permitting to do this. We can, actual fact put a, uh, a, drill pro a drill project uh, going right now if we wanted to and uh, uh, no, uh, no recourse to, uh, to permitting, et cetera, and so forth. So um, the average grade that was mined there was over 10 ounces a ton, uh, along with 10% uh, lead and about 3% uh, zinc, I think it was. It was a highly profitable mine, but Asako owned uh, a number of mines in the valley, and as the various commodity prices would move up and down, they would move between the mines. So uh, uh, it's got an enormous prospect, and uh, we're really, really pleased with it. Graham, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I hope I've uh, managed to um, bring some light to the subject. It's never an easy thing talking about uh, uh, any company and uh, market conditions like this, um, especially when... Um, the regulatory environment creates more difficulty for everyone, but um, I'm pleased to have been here, and uh, thank you very much. My guest has been Graham O'Neill, President and CEO of Bay Horse Silver, his website, bayhorsesilver.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark, Joseph Schachter, and Graham O'Neill, and thank you for listening. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.